Good evening and welcome to tonight's meeting with the Workers' Party of Britain. Tonight's meeting, the economics of capitalism, free market or monopoly, is brought to us by Dr. Ranjit Bra. So thanks very much, Dr. Bra. If you can uh, unmute yourself. Thanks very much, Rob. Are you hearing me okay? Hearing you fine. Fantastic. So thanks everyone for coming back and joining us again. As you know, this is our regular Tuesday meeting of the Workers' Party, uh, growing force uh, to promote socialism in the interests of working people in Britain, and we hope make an impact on British politics and around the world. Normally we're blessed uh, in our leadership, um, uh, Jyoti Bra and George Galloway, the leaders of our party. George Galloway uh, is indefatigable, uh, and as you know, he's just recently had his third child with his lovely wife, Gatri. So we wish them again all the very best. And I hear that they're doing very, very well indeed. George never rests. Uh, George uh, has been very, had a very high profile with a lot of fantastic interventions around the question of Scottish independence. And I'm very excited that that project continues to grow and gain, gain a lot of traction. And is getting a huge amount of press coverage in the national media. And I think the point that he made this week, that if there's going to be yet another referendum on Scottish, the question of Scottish independence, then all the people of Scotland, including those who are not currently resident in Scotland, uh, should have a vote, gain huge traction, wide support. And I would be very surprised if there was going to be another referendum, whether that wouldn't be implemented. So sending our best wishes out to George. George will be back with us and we'll continue these Tuesday meetings for as long as we continue them. And while lockdown is over for the most part, um, it continues to be the case that this medium and our ability to meet virtually has been a tremendous boon to us in this period. So I hope that we will continue them for some time to come. So George will be back with us. In the meantime, I hope you'll find these sessions useful. Uh, and uh, we'll uh, share them, look back at them again if there are any bits that you think are of particular interest. Um, and what we're really trying to do is revisit what should be the very basics uh, of an understanding of socialism. Um, the great scientific uh, socialist thinkers have left us treasures um, for the liberation of working people. And really, we're just going to go through some of those again today. Uh, and a, a very quick recap of the last two, three meetings, and then move on to a couple of new issues. So I'm just going to share this with you now. Hopefully you can see this. And this is what we're talking about. We're talking about uh, the science of socialism. Rob, can you see that okay? Because I have got a picture which is not right. Uh <clears throat> Yeah, I can see most of the screen. Yeah, um, it, but you're in in a panel down the side that's uh, just obscuring the right hand side. Okay. Let's say that uh, that's the best I can manage, but I'm not seeing it quite right. But there you are. Okay. We'll we'll, we'll press on. Hopefully that you can see what I'm what I'm presenting you. So we're talking about the science of socialism, and this time I'm going to focus in particular on the secret of capitalist exploitation. So we've said that since socialism has become a science, it should be studied. We talked in the very first session about political economy. And we said that political economy in the wider sense is the science of the laws governing the production and exchange of the material means of subsistence in human society. So it's basically economics is the way in which we organize as societies around the way we produce that gives rise to the kind of society in which we live. We talked about uh, in our second session how society became capitalist. Have classes always existed is the question we posed. We answered that with a negative. Classes have not always existed. We saw how with increased productivity of labor, division of labor, their classes came into existence and went through a number of permutations before arising at uh, capitalist society. And in capitalist society, small scale production is replaced by large scale production everywhere. And the masses of workmen are already simply hired men working for wages for a capitalist who owns tremendous capital, uh, money, uh, value, uh, wealth, okay? Builds tremendous workshops, purchases masses of materials and crucially pockets all the profits of this mass production 
of the United Working Men. And so we had the emergence of the two, increasingly society being split up into two great hostile camps. Great in the sense of uh, important economically, of course, in terms of greatness of numbers, the working class become the overwhelming mass of humanity, well in excess of 90, 99% of the population. And the real capitalists, the real billionaires who have a monopoly on production are a great class in the sense that they have great power through their great wealth and they have irreconcilably antagonistic interests to the vast mass of the creative working people. So we have the workers on the one hand and the capitalist on the other. So we looked at the uh, last week at some details of simple commodity production and how its development came to bring about capitalism. Capitalism, the state in which commodity production, so that's production for sale rather than consumption myself, became the predominant form of production. And labor power itself, the ability to work, becomes a commodity like any other can be bought and sold. We talked about, and I just wanted to recap on this, um, the question of what makes something valuable, what gives it exchange value? Why do we give a certain amount of one kind of substance in exchange for a certain amount of another kind of substance or why it's worth a certain amount of money, which is the same question. And we said, basically, you know, things have value because they're products of human labor. So human labor time is embodied in them, abstract human labor time, and that gives them the ability to exchange the most diverse things, which otherwise have nothing in common in terms of their physical and chemical makeup. It's the amount of work that goes to producing it, ultimately, that gives it its value. Uh, and that value, of course, we said that, that that labor time had to be socially necessary. There's no point in me spending three weeks producing something that can be produced with modern uh, industry in a matter of minutes, it won't be worth any more because I've spent my three weeks on it. it, must be socially necessary. So in other words, under the normal conditions of production and with the average degree of skill and intensity prevalent at, at that time. And we talked because of this exchange uh, of commodities, how the development of money came uh, into being and how we look upon money now as being something totally separate from all the rest of the commodities. And it is the embodiment, it's what we think of when we say something's valuable, we think inevitably of money. Money seems separate and divorced from other commodities, but actually we said that inherent value is a property of all commodities. And this was just a function of exchange, but money goes on. And today we're talking about capitalist exploitation and the new features that uh, money acquires as it becomes capital and the new features of society that brings about. And I wanna particularly look at the question of how are workers exploited under capitalism? What is the secret of capitalist exploitation? How are workers made to work for the capitalist? It's a free country, we're constantly told that we can choose to work or not to work. So surely we're all entering into free relations, free contractual obligations to each other, freely entered into. So what is this that I'm talking about, exploitation? Are we made to work for the capitalist? Uh, and why does the capitalist grow rich? while the workers are impoverished. I put up that little clip there, that's from the Financial Times a couple of days ago. Um, Priti Patel, our Home Secretary in Britain, has called out Boohoo, the fashion company, you'll see the adverts all over the tube, all over the place, all over buses, um, who sell very cheap uh, items of clothing, um, high fashion, large turnover, uh, and they are involved with many other clothing companies. It turned out that during the time of um, the renewed spike in cases of coronavirus in Leicester, it was essentially due to um, people working in close unsanitary conditions in sweatshops. And it further turned out that it was widely known that these sweatshops existed and that the wages were something around the two to three pound an hour um, rate for many workers, which is a, a, a pitiful rate and certainly well under the so-called minimum wage or living wage. Uh, and therefore, Priti Patel has said that this is um, explo an exploitative practice. It's widely being discussed as a kind of slave labor condition. But we're gonna ask what is um, exploitation under capitalism? Is it just having low wages? Um, or is it in fact something more inherent in the entire mechanism of production than that? So capitalism, 
is commodity production at its highest stage of development, when labor power itself becomes a commodity. So people themselves are hiring out their ability to work in order to get money. So all products are commodities under capitalism. And for capitalism to exist, for this uh, production system to prevail, wage labor, the worker uh, has to be free in the sense of he's free of the fuel restraints. And we looked at that in, in our second um, um, meeting together. Uh, so he's free of being tied to the land. He's free of the obligations to the Lord. He's, he's come out of that. So there, uh, you know, normally a historical struggle has had to happen to free the worker, but he's free in a double sense. He's also free of his own means of production. So he's free of the ability to use his own labor in a modern sense, in a productive sense, in a competitive sense, to produce things that he can sell, he or she can sell. And the profit motive is the overwhelming uh, motive for production. How did the capitalists become rich? It's a very important question. And they became rich partly through their struggle with feudalism, partly through trade, partly through growing up within the body of feudalism. But then there were certain measures that they took once they had political power, which further increased their wealth. And a particular one was the enclosures of the land. Uh, and there were a whole series of enclosures at different historical stages, um, at different places throughout the British Isles. And that was essentially an act which drove the peasantry from the land and in that sense freed them so it was, a, it was an act of usurpation it was it was illegal essentially at the time to take the land from the peasants but it drove them from their um pieces of land which allowed them to work the land and feed themselves um, and freed them then to work in developing industry freed the land to be turned over to more profitable um agricultural and arable um uses uh, by the major land holders, major landlords, who were a class, who were a mixture of the nascent bourgeoisie and the old feudal uh, ruling class. More than that, the 17th century early European capitalist powers developed their trade with all corners of the world, and as they became important um, and powerful traders, increasingly in India, China, and the Americas, developed a world market, and through that world market, and particularly through um, not just trade, but open colonialization of conquering other lands, of plundering them very directly through slavery in the transatlantic slave trade. Um, they became incredibly wealthy. And a few pictures here. This is uh, a depiction of Cortez uh, when he came into collision with the Native American um, peoples of, uh, of the Aztecs and the Incas, Aztecs in particular. Um, it's the picture of the battle, oh, actually this is the Opium Wars uh, with China of 1842. So wars that were fought by the British to force opium, to force trade, to force their cheap industrial products also uh, on China, a country that was very developed, but not at the capitalist stage of development. This is the Battle of Plassey, famous battle uh, between the British East India Company led by uh, Lord Clive, as he became Clive of India in 1757, which symbolized really the emergence of the beginning of company rule uh, in India and British colonialism in India, uh, with all the attendant miseries that that caused. And of course, the transatlantic slave trade of which there's been much discussion, but very little in the way of recognition that actually this is one of the primitive methods uh, trade trade in human flesh but also export of its cheap commodities to africa import of raw materials to work up in industry in britain was the mechanism by which an entire class gained sufficient capital a sufficient wealth to be able to develop and further the entire industrial production and upon which our civilization in Britain uh, and European imperialist powers have built the modern wealth. So it's on two feet that imperialism has stood on naked exploitation of the colonies, but also on robbery and impoverishment of its own people. And we're gonna look 
at the mechanism, the economic mechanism by which the capitalist becomes rich. We just remind ourselves that we discussed labor power. Um, labor power, the ability to work, the aggregate of those mental and physical capabilities existing in a human being, which he exercises whenever he produces use value of any description. So our ability to work, mental and physical, to produce things that are useful to humanity is labor power. It creates all wealth as we've seen. And the, we've seen in capitalism that becomes itself a commodity. So the capitalist buys labor power in order to use it. And labor power in use is labor itself. So it pay, pays wages to the worker to put the work, worker to work. And then in the act of work, you know, that labor creates all values. Use value has to be a useful object that can be sold. But in the act of selling it, it creates exchange value, creates all human wealth. Simple commodity production we looked at last week. Someone as division of labor occurs within society, people become specialists in certain things rather than the peasant household producing everything it needs itself, um, their specialization. So distinctive trades, so many of our surnames have the essentially the hallmark of this process that we, people are called Fletcher because their family made arrows, people are called Cooper because their family made barrels, bakers, etc, etc. So many names are associated uh, with the trades that people took up during this specialist period, period of specialization. So a baker now doesn't make everything for himself, he makes bread, he makes bread on a mass scale, and he does so not just to eat himself, but to make a commodity to, to sell. And once he's sold it, he can use the money that he gets to buy whatever else he needs in this example, shoes. So he starts with a commodity, he's making a commodity, he sells it, he gets money, and he uses that money to buy the other commodities that he needs. This was the initial simple commodity production that came to light with the division of um, labor within society. But once money is on the scene, it also becomes put to use as capital. And that's a slightly different um, equation. The capitalist starts with money. He uses it to acquire a commodity. In this instance, say, bread. And then he sells it once again for money. But process of simple money to commodity to money, essentially the same process it seems, but it's slightly different because he doesn't do it just in order to have the same amount of money. The whole point, and this is a Benjamin Franklin quote, money makes money. And money that makes money makes more money. So this concept that money makes money is one that we're all kind of aware of. How do you get rich? Well, money, money makes money. You've got to be rich to get rich. And so the whole point is then that there's a new form of circulation, money to commodity to money, whether it's, you know, this is meant to represent simple trade, but it's something slightly more than that. Uh, and the question is, how does that capital increase? Um, is it by simply adding value? If I've got a commodity, I buy bread at three pounds, I don't want to sell it at four pounds, so I just add the price and sell it all. Have I added value? Would I be able to sell it if I sell it in that manner? It doesn't explain where that value comes from. But there is a concept that simply people just arbitrarily add on a bit more and then sell it on and add on a bit more and sell it on. But why are they able to sell it? Uh, if it's above the market price, they won't be able to sell it. So it doesn't explain where that wealth comes from. Um, is it simply from stealing? Um, do they actually engage in robbery, either from the person that they've taken goods from or selling goods to? So are they buying below the value and selling above the value of the goods. That might explain an individual, how it becomes wealthy, but it wouldn't explain the enrichment of a class, of a steady class of people who are able to perform this function of engaging in trade, engaging in production, starting with money, investing it, selling their goods to convert it back to money and constantly getting richer while the workers clearly don't. The workers as a class become poorer. So what we have to ask ourselves, and what the early socialist thinkers did ask themselves is what is this special commodity that exists that can create value, that creates money, that creates wealth? And that would then explain how, when reselling that commodity, in the use of that commodity, more value is created. And it comes back to the slide that we had before, this commodity really does exist. When labor power has become 
a commodity because the capitalist buys the labor power in order to use it. And by putting workers to work, that labor then, that new work that's performed when the capitalist pays the wages to the worker, new work is performed, creates new value, new wealth, and then selling the goods that are made above the investment costs, okay? Because there's been new labor, which has created new wealth added to the new goods that are sold, value is created. But the question arises then, what is the value of the labor power itself? What are the wages that are fair? What are the wages that should be paid to the worker? Is it by simply uh, an act of robbery uh, from the worker that the capitalist becomes rich? So value, we said under commodity production um, of labor power, of bananas, of bread, of milk, of butter, of sugar, of tea, all things, the value has the same formula and it's the same for labor power. Value, exchange value, the amount of money something is worth is dependent on the labor required to produce an article under normal conditions of production and with the average degree of skill and intensity prevalent at the time. So what does it cost to produce labor power, the ability to work, a healthy um, body and mind of a working man or woman? And the answer is, uh, in economic terms, is that it creates that you need food, to sustain the worker and their family, clothing, shelter, culture, schooling, healthcare. You need all the wherewithal of life to create and recreate that labor. And, you know, if him to have a family or her to have a family and reproduce that labor power generation after generation. So that's what's necessary for the working man to live and come back and offer his or her uh, work, his labor power, his ability to work and his actual work to the capitalist day after day. So it is the amount that it costs the worker to live at a given level, a given historically accepted level, which again changes um, between societies and from time to time, that constitutes what is the price of labor power, what is the wage of the capitalist, what, that the capitalist offers workers. So then where does the profit come from? How does value created by some, and we contend created by the workers, go into the pockets of others? How does it end up in the pocket of the capitalist? And again, we have to look at the process of production. What does the capitalist have to do to produce his commodities? He has to buy certain things. He needs land and premises, uh, land upon which to build his premises, the premises itself, the bricks and mortar, the necessary machinery uh, to, to go inside his factories needs fuel to power the factories, the raw materials to work up, and then of course the labor power, the workers themselves. And then after that whole process, he will sell the proceeds of production to realize the cost of the production and his profit. Let's just put some arbitrary figures on all of this, just so that we can understand what we're talking about. Now, I fully accept, and you will be aware, that when you go into the marketplace, you don't buy a pencil uh, with uh, one minute's worth of labor time. We don't exchange labor time directly. We exchange it for prices, for costs, for goods. It's going to be £1.20 for a pencil, maybe it'll be 35 pence for a pencil. So it, you'll have to just bear with me. We could clearly then substitute um, all of these uh, values in terms of hours of labor necessary to produce a thing by amounts of money and different currencies and different currencies different place and there's an entire industry in speculating in currency and realizing that there's slight discrepancies uh, that work themselves out through the market so there's 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 money to be made in all of these ways in speculative ways on the stock market but if we accept our premise that ultimately value is determined by the amount of time necessary to produce things and this is the basic premise of traditional capitalist political economy. It's the basic premise of uh, our understanding of socialist economics. And it's our basic premise upon which we can understand. And it's very powerful because it lays bare the, precisely the way in which uh, workers are exploited under capitalism. So let's just suspend your disbelief uh, for a little while, if you have disbelief. And let's just, we'll, we'll go through these, these things. So say in a given period of time, say for uh, 
uh, five days worth of production. The cost to the capitalist for his land and premises, his machinery, his fuel, and his raw materials will be equivalent to uh, the money needed uh, for to pay for 3,000 hours of labor. So that's the fraction of the machinery used up in that period of production, the fraction of the cost of the hire of the land and premises. That's the cost of the fuel used up in that period of time, and it's the cost of the raw material used up in that time to come up with his finished goods, which in this case is going to be a tire. So the cost of that is going to be 3,000 hours of labor. In addition, during these five days, he adds 1,000 hours of labor. Then you can see that to the cost of all of the things that are used up in production, including the raw materials and the fixed assets, He's adding new value, which is essentially the amount of time that his laborers were employed working up those raw materials using all of the machinery and the fuel in order to produce his finished product. And they've added on 4,000 hours of labor. So when he sells those tires, in addition to his out, the costs that he outlaid, which is 3,000 hours of labor, he's added 1,000 and he will sell um, at a higher price than all of his raw materials and cost of production. And he will gain the price equivalent to 4,000 hours. So that there, his profit is realized. So what are the, so that's what the tires were. So if we're talking about tires that he's making, uh, 20 workers say worked for 10 hours a day for the five days, hence the 1,000 hours of socially necessary labor time. So they couldn't have done it without the factory, without the raw materials, without the fuel to produce in an efficient way, which is the standard method of production prevalent under capitalism at any one time. And so the 3000 hours of transferred value that he, of, the, of the materials he bought that added to 1000 hours of new uh, labor time in those five days. But what were the wages of the workers? We said that the wages of the workers are not the total value that he produces, but the value of the socially necessary labor time to produce what they need. So let's assume that the value of the labor power of a single worker for a single day is actually five hours of socially necessary labor time. So it's a certain wage, which is less than the amount of work that he is doing, the amount of value he's producing in that time. So in that case, 20 men who work for five days, that's 100 days of work. And if each of them needs for their wage during that period of time, uh, five hours, that means that the, the capitalist will have to spend the equivalent value of 500 labor hours to hire the workers. And so there's a discrepancy there. He has added in the whole productive process a thousand hours of value in his finished product. And half of that, 500 hours, will go to paying the wages of the worker. And then half of it clearly is his profit. But all of that, the money necessary for the wages, and the money for the profit has all come from the productive process from the work of uh, the factory hands within the work within the workplace. Okay, so that's just saying the same thing again. So 3000 hours of labor was the land machinery fuel raw material. The labor power, the cost of 1000 hours of labor power was actually only 500 hours of labor. So for all of the, the time that the workers are working, they're producing value, but the actual amount they get in wages is in fact a fraction of the value that they produce. So when he finally sells his tires, assuming that he finds that there's a need on the market, and again, a feature of capitalism is that there's without a plan. So it's by no means guaranteed that when the capitalist takes his goods to market, he is able to sell them all. But let's assume that he has sold them all. Then despite paying the market rate, the fair price, in you know, a fair day's wage for a fair day's work. So the capitalist has fulfilled the trade union slogan, which still is prevalent. Fair day's wage for a fair day's work. He's not cheated the worker. He's given him the market value based upon the value of his work. And the value of his work is the socially necessary labor time to produce it. So he's given workers a fair wage. And yet still, half of the hours that the, the worker worked were essentially unpaid. And so it turns out that under capitalism, just as under feudalism, just under slavery, in fact, the exploited class, the working class 
are performing surplus labor. They're performing labor for which they're not paid. So if the entire working day is 10, working day is 10 out at 10 hours, and this is arbitrary and this fraction changes, but it's illustrative and it helps you to understand the secret of where this profit comes from. Uh, and if anything, probably uh, the necessary labor is less than half the day, but let's just go with this for the time being. So this is, if the entire working day is 10 hours, then you can say for the first half of the day, for the five hours that the worker works producing those tires during that period of time or whatever good they're producing, he's producing enough profit actually to pay his own wages to feed, clothe, house himself, his family, to really produce themselves, to give themselves whatever level of culture they're used to. But that's it, but he's been paid wages for the whole day. So he doesn't simply go home when he's worked the necessary labor time, but he stays on to complete his contractual hours, to complete his working obligations under heavy penalties uh, if he's not uh, going to fulfill it. And he performs a further five hours labor, during which time all the value that he produces is the profit of the capitalist. And there we have surplus value. So the wage laborer sells his labor power to the owner of land, of factories, and, to, uh, and the instruments of labor, the capitalist. The worker uses one part of the labor day to cover the expenditure for the maintenance of himself and his family as wages. And the other part of the day he toils without remuneration, without pay effectively, and creates surplus value for the capitalist, which is the source of profit, the source of wealth of the capitalist class. And there's a nice picture there of the ragged trousered philanthropist. I think there's a very nice scene in there, um, section of the book called The Money Trick, when this con trick with wages is explained, how the worker constantly uh, is um, given wages and has to give them back to the capitalist in order to get his necessities of life, and just never manages to accumulate anything, work, eat, sleep, pay for your houses, pay for your meager entertainment, whatever it happens to be, and return week after week, day after day, week after week, year after year, performing the same process without really being able to put anything aside. Some people, of course, manage to put a little bit aside. Some people manage to buy their own home. Um, if you then become old and unwell, very often you're forced to sell it to pay for your care, but you're never really accumulating great wealth. Meanwhile, the capitalist employing more and more workers becomes more and more wealthy because each day, each day that uh, we work, each individual worker is produced, is performing surplus labor, unpaid labor, that's work um, uh, whose value created, the wealth created goes directly into the pocket of another, of the capitalist class. And so then exploitation is not a product of excessively low wages, though that obviously deepens the exploitation, worsens the condition of the worker, and it's something against which we have to absolutely fight to get the greatest share, as long as capitalism exists, the greatest share of the wealth we produce. That is the role of trade unionism, it's the role of our economic struggle, and it's the function of socialism. But also, you know, exploitation, this unpaid labor is a feature, inherent feature of the wages system itself. And as long as we are the paid wage workers of capital, then we will be performing this unpaid labor will be enriching the capitalist class through every hour, through every moment we're at work, we get relatively poorer, they get relatively weaker. And it's in this sense that uh, socialists refer to wage slavery. It's very clear when the slave is kept down by a slave owner, he feels like he's getting nothing. That is, all of his work is forced out of him. He feels like a drudge, he doesn't have an interest in work. Um, it feels that work as oppression, exploitation is enforced with strict penalties, often physical penalties, the wish, the whip, the lash, um, all kinds of cruel tortures. It's clear to the slave that who his oppressor is and have that he's being uh, oppressed and that his work is being stolen. It's not clear to the slave, it's hidden to him that actually there are certain things that the slave owner has to give to him, food, clothing, shelter, just to maintain his um, ability to carry on work. So that part which he gets himself is kind of hidden under slavery. Under feudalism, the relationship between the exploiting class and the exploited class is most clear because there's literally periods of time when you're working on your own land, on your own account, periods of time when you're working on the Lord's uh, estate for the Lord. So it's very clear what percentage of the time is yours and what percentage of the time and work and value is stolen. Under capitalism, it's 
particularly well hidden. It seems like you're getting paid for every hour that you work, but it remains the case that the value you create while you're working is far in excess of your wages. And so essentially that means that a period of the day you're being paid for and a large period of the day, increasingly large period of the day, you're actually not getting paid for, but all the value you create is going into the pockets of your uh, capitalist employing class. And this is the secret um, of capitalist exploitation. And the advent of money means that actually under capitalism, this exploitation is far more intense than it has been under previous society where predominantly natural production prevailed. And there was a limit to the ability of the feudal lord or the sl ancient slave owners to um, you know, consume. How much can they possibly consume in the form of profit? But while this constant desire to make more money money begets money and then the money that that makes makes more money and this is you know american president uh, resident presidents who have their heads printed on the money and you know dead presidents has become almost a slang for money itself the two are so connected um, but there's an insatiable greed of the capitalist to carry on making more and more and more money and to ratchet up exploitation now under capitalism there is a natural desire for innovation and mechanization. And the reason uh, that that's the case is that through competition, through cheapening uh, the price of production by putting less labor time into each item produced. So a toaster can be produced with less labor time, it will be cheaper. You'll undercut your uh, competitors and you'll be able to sell um, at a price that is higher than your cost of production because your average amount of labor time invested in each individual item is lower. So this drives um, increasing mechanization and technical innovation under capitalism. And this was an early phenomenon which is witnessed under capitalism. And so cheapening goods, you undercut the competition. You also discharge more laborers. You need fewer and fewer laborers to produce the, um, the same quantity or a greater quantity of goods and that creates unemployment. And in so creating this massive unemployment, uh, you're also reducing the rate of profit per item. So you need to sell more goods. Each individual good has less labor time. You need to sell more and more of them to realize the same amount of profit. And at the same time, you're discharging more and more of your workers. So more and more workers are without the means to buy them. And it's this inherent mechanism of one capitalist killing many, of the capitalist discharging his workforce, of cheapening large numbers of goods, cheaper goods, but impoverishing the ultimate market of workers that causes this constant drive towards crisis. And despite all the technical innovation that capitalism produces, it has never been able to free itself of regular crises. Whereas under socialism, and you know, it doesn't have to be this way. It's absolutely possible for rational planning. I mean, as enterprises become more and more massive, as monopoly enterprises arise, they try and plan production within their enterprise on a bigger and bigger scale. And yet still there exists competition between the few remaining players and they're unable to, to um, conquer the problem of crises. But we can produce according to a plan on a mass scale all that we produce will be ours to dispose of. And in that way, we can cause a rising standard of life, no longer having to produce enormous surplus profits for a capitalist before the wheels of production are put in motion, but producing what we need, when we need, in the manner we need, in a sustainable manner. In this way, the harder we work, the better our lives will become. Workers can increasingly have more time for rest and leisure, which were the promised benefits of technology. That we'd all have more time for rest and leisure, but in fact, those who are work have increased intensity, longer hours, a harder grind, uh, and on they are met by a counterbalancing force of increased mass of people who are unemployed and want to have time, have no means to um, give themselves what's necessary for a decent life. So socially administered production 
will mean that we will be able to produce what we need and have a good quality of life, cultured life for all, expand production, um, look after each other, create everything that we need in society for um, a logical and rational existence, free of exploitation for man by man. So what is capital? At the end of the day, capital is not a thing. Capital is a social relation. Under capitalism, exploitation of workers is only possible because all wealth is concentrated in the hands of the capitalist class. The capitalist owns the means of production. He owns the land. He owns the means of subsistence without which we can't um, live. So we constantly have to return day after day to sell our ability to work in order to get wages, to have the bare uh, necessities of life. Production is all for profit and without a plan. So capitalism is not a thing, it's not an individual good, it's not even a definite quantity of money, because a definite quantity is nothing without that real social relation, which has freed the mass of the workers from the ability to gain the fruits of our labor ourselves and has concentrated the wealth in this tiny uh, clique of multimillionaires and billionaires who control production. And as I said, it's gone to such enormous uh, extremes that we have the incredible spectacle really uh, along just the lines pointed out by those great socialist thinkers who are seeing this develop uh, in the 19th century and 18th century whereby now, today, as we sit here, the six richest men on earth, and they are men, have more money than the poorest half of the planet's population, three and a half billion people. And so capital is dead labor. And by dead labor, we mean that all wealth, as we saw, is accumulated labor. So it's the work of previous uh, generations, the work of previous productive enterprises. So it's the work of workers that has resulted in all wealth. The wealth that rests in the hand of the multi-billionaires is because they've managed to accumulate wealth through historical processes as we've seen and through exploitation of other workers that constantly enriches them. So it's dead labor. Their money is dead labor. It was created by workers or work that is no longer being performed. Yes, by some dead workers who have gone in previous generations, but work that has already been performed. But all of our work creates wealth and puts it in their hands. So capital is dead labor. That vampire-like only lives by sucking living labor. It's the constant quest of these uh, magnets, uh, you know, have more power, more wealth than any Marie Antoinette, than any Genghis Khan, than any historical figure, um, Louis the Sixteenth, any, you know, than any historical figure of the Middle Ages, they've got more wealth and more power. It's their constant endeavor to take all the money that they've made from exploiting wage labor and find a way to make yet more money from it, yet more money from it. And yet, when they impoverish the vast mass of working people, you know, actually, they make production unprofitable. There are huge swathes of humanity who are so poor, you can't make money from selling things to them. And it's almost as if they don't exist. They, ex they, they exercise no effective demand on the capitalist system. And it's why all these social problems accumulate that these billionaires, for all their alleged uh, willingness to engage and solve the world's problems, are totally unable to do so through the market mechanisms uh, that have enriched them. Rather, they constantly strive to maximize profit. And the ways to maximize profit under capitalist production are to increase the amount of surplus labor in every way possible. And they're, and they're logical ways, the ways that we're familiar with. They would increase the overall working day. And very early on, under capitalist production, working days were incredibly long. Mill owners would, you know, you'd be lucky if you got four, five, six hours of sleep and the rest of your time, the entire working lives of workers were expected to be, uh, you know, performing uh, this drudgery, this labor for the capitalist in their mines and mills. Um, increasing, therefore, the surplus labor, that the, the unpaid labor time, the amount of money they were making 
for the capitalist, and that, that's fairly self-explanatory. They found early on ways to increase the intensity of work. Uh, we looked at some of those, uh, it's so-called Taylorism uh, last week, uh, which was ways of planning and taking account of every minute uh, of productive time and ensuring that the worker through speeding up of the process of the machine, through expecting them to meet certain targets, um, you can actually force out of a worker in their given working time, a level of productivity which exhausts them, leads to premature aging and ill health, but produces uh, from a given period of time that which would be reasonably produced by a longer working day. So intensification of work, uh, uh, of labor and then of course decreasing the wages of, uh, of of the worker and that really uh, can be done in several ways you can cheapen the cost of production of the food clothing housing shelter etc of the workers through increasing technology and that is a phenomenon that happens um, if you looked at the corn laws in Victorian society um, the process of it relatively impoverishing the landlord class and meaning that they couldn't get protective monopoly prices for the corn they were selling meant that actually the cost of producing the bread for the workers suddenly went down. So at the expense of the landlords, huge um, profits were made by the uh, industrial capitalists because they cheapened the wage of their worker because it was no longer necessary to give them so much money to buy their bread. So you can cheapen the cost of the food, clothing, housing of the workers, and then actually the wages will sink and go down. And you can simply force the workers to have lower standard of living. Tell them that, you know, we're really not making enough money. It's hard times. You've got to tighten your belt. You've got to accept less. Otherwise, the whole factory will go out of business. And then we're, you know, we're all in this together. But in one way or another, forcing workers to have a lower wage and therefore effectively increasing the amount of time that they're working um, pro bono, really. They're doing charity work, this ragged, trousered philanthropy that every day, every worker, in every enterprise performs for the capitalist class. And so the work of unions, the work of socialists is to resist this ceaseless encroachment of capital, is to realize that a better socialist world is possible, to never lose sight of the fact that the wages system itself is our form of slavery, that we are all wage slaves under this system. And so while we constantly fight the encroachment of capital while we constantly fight for higher wages under capitalism what we really have to also bear in mind is that we will forever remain in this subordinate position forever getting poorer forever running to stand still and failing um, until we learn that what we really need to end is the system of capitalist exploitation itself and so a workers party must be a party that fights to defend workers interest now for higher workers, but we must never lose sight of the fact that we need to fight for socialism, for a better and brighter world, which will be made possible by the abolition of exploitation of man by man and nation by nation, where we'll all work as free individuals, we'll give our work essentially vol voluntarily, and we can talk a bit more about that. We can constantly, as we work harder, have a better standard of life and build a decent rational society that doesn't know want, doesn't know hunger, doesn't know poverty, doesn't know war. And we can rationally use all of the technology that humanity has to really build a sane and cultured life for us all. Thanks very much. Thank you, Ranji, for another stellar presentation. Very thorough one at that. Now going to go to questions and answers. Going to take a couple of questions at a time and then return to Ranjit for a wrap up. So first of all, I'm going to go to Bob. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me? Loud and clear, Bob. Hello. Okay. Uh, all I was trying to say is it doesn't matter whether I've got a tin in my hand or a bottle in my hand. I've still got a valid point to put across. And in the 70s... Absolutely, Bob. Can you ask your question, yeah. please, mate? Yeah, by all means. Um, about this, uh, you know, what you were saying, Doctor. <laughs> Sorry about that, Ranji. Um, 
the point I'm trying to make was in this up to now, there's millions and millions and millions of motors being parked up, brand spanking new. And what's going to happen to them? They're all rusted whilst they're out in, a, in airports and car parks and all the rest of it. I mean, they're doing that just to keep the prices of motors at the are now. I'm sorry if I'm sounding a bit muffled, but these earphones don't do me no justice, I tell you. I don't like them. And I'm sorry if, you know, I'm not usually a, an outgoing person, so you have to excuse that. All I'm saying is, check it out on YouTube, right? Cars that are unsold, what happens to them? And they sit there and sit there, and then they crush them. Brand spanking new motors, they crush them so that they can keep the prices at the are today. So obviously, just look, I tried to send it to Rob, uh, you know, at one of the videos yeah. to share on Zoom, but at the moment, nobody knows how to do that. So all I'm saying is, listen, there's billions and billions being wasted and it's not right, especially when we're all keeping up for food stamps. It's not right. That's all I wanted to say. That's all I've wanted to say for the last two weeks. No worries, right. Bob. You're absolutely That's spot it. on. You're absolutely spot on, Bob. You can see in most ports and other places, cars and many other things stacking up uh, because of the crisis of overproduction. Uh, I'm going to go to Martin now. Uh, you had a question in the chat, buddy. Right. Okay. Now, can you see and hear me? Loud and clear, Martin. All right. Okay. No, it was just a question. I understand perfectly how, um, how, the, the, how the system works in terms of um, wage labour, a capitalist system. But I just wanted, because it's, it's our um, economy that we live in is also dependent on, on public sector workers. Now, the, the, the aim of public sector institutions or primary aim is not necessarily to make a profit. I know that's been increased privatisation, but I don't really, um, I, I'd like Randy to explain a bit about um, how wage labour works, where the, where the in, in, in public, public sector institutions, such as a teacher in a state school or a nurse in a hospital and 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 and, and that. that 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 type of work where 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 it's not so obvious that um, those employees are working to make make capitalist richer. Okay, brilliant question, Martin. I'm going to go to Helen now, and then we'll go back to Ranji. Thanks, Ed. Um, th thanks for another brilliant uh, talk, Ranji. Um, you've highlighted there some of the um, so some of the real problems with capitalism. Um, not least the problem of you know workers feeling, you know, having to give up every hour to this wage slavery to the worker to, to the capitalist you know it's as if they have to it's as if they have to um uh, work and and go through this drudgery uh, just in order to justify their existence you know and i think a lot of people have been persuaded somehow that that is how they should live that that is the right way to live you know um but i've also heard it said if you look at the alternative um existing ideologies 
I, I've heard a, an argument a lot that um, where under socialism and particularly communism, um, they say things that like people have everything taken away from them. They're not allowed to have possessions and the state interferes with everything. And I've also heard it said a lot that uh, uh, millions of people have died under communism so that there's no alternative to capitalism because capitalism is the best thing. Uh, can you address that, please? Great question, Hell. If you'd like to come back on those, Ranji, that would be great. Can you hear me okay? Loud and clear, buddy. Perfect. Great questions. Thank you all. Um, I'll try and, uh, and address some of them. Some of them, um, I, I'm not sure how long we're going to keep these meetings going in, 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 on this specific question of economics, but some of them um, I think we're going to address in the next couple of sessions. But on this question of uh, cars being parked and then, and then crushed, uh, so it is the case during a crisis and we're in the midst of probably the deepest economic crisis that the world has ever seen now. Um, and it's going to hit and continue to hit hard over the coming weeks and months. Um, we're expecting something like a fifth of the value of the UK economy to be wiped out over this year, depending on which forecast you look at. Um, unemployment in the United States has already gone over 52 million. And there is chronic underemployment and unemployment around the world. So if we look at that, you know, idea that the capitalist constantly is producing without a plan, producing without a plan in order to sell as many goods as he can, but in order to cheapen his goods, he's constantly putting people um, out of work. The, the, the general that wins the battle of production is the capitalist who discharges most of his army. It's a really strange idea that you're gonna make more money with less labor power to have more machines. It actually means that production is expensive to get going, but the final good that you produce, you reduce more and more and more of it with less and less and less labor power. But you're paying less and less wages, meaning that as a class, the working class are becoming more and more impoverished. And who are you gonna actually sell everything to in the last analysis? You've got to sell it back to the mass of the people. If half the world's population have less money than six people, how are those six people gonna keep on pumping out more and more goods and be able to sell them to all? They, 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 they physically can't, they can't sell the goods, goods are wasted. And you had this you know, spectacle that drove um, the socialist movement, especially in the 20s and the 30s of the last century, but is driving it again, that you're seeing incredible waste, incredible waste of human life, incredible waste of human potential, but also the waste of products that we've produced, people starving around the world. Well, there's actually no shortage of food. There's enough to food to feed the world many times over. You know, people's basic needs not being met when we're spending hundreds of billions on armaments and other weapons uh, to reinforce this system, which doesn't make any sense. So this phenomenon of tremendous waste of what is produced because people have been impoverished. Yeah, you're seeing it with cars, you're seeing it with all kinds of goods. Um, and actually production is just mothballed, production is stopped. People are asked to job share, you know, you, two people do one person's job, kind of spread the misery you know, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, the, in a country like Germany that are relatively well uh, organized. They're kind of spreading, they're, they're publishing everyone, you know, by spreading, reducing the numbers of work. In most countries, it's not done so evenly. So huge numbers of people are finding themselves without work. The furlough scheme is gonna end. More people are gonna find themselves without work. Um, so this is a real, real inherent problem that capitalism cannot move beyond and inevitably has a tendency to drive out of by destroying goods and ultimately destroying lives by driving towards war as a means of getting production going. Um, and in that process of war, Huge profits are made for certain capitalists. People are put back to work the work of war and killing hundreds of millions. Even though we can never forget that 100 million people died in the, in the last century uh, in the two world wars alone. And, you know, those, perhaps that just is worth touching on, on Hell's question about, you know, is socialism a great massacre? Does it cause great murders of the people? And the answer to that is no. We live in a, we touched on this again last week, we live in a system which is incredibly violent. 
um, in which there's never not been a single day's peace actually since the Second World War. But if you just look at those two mass slaughters, those two mass slaughters were not just kind of accidents that happened. They were the products of two great groups of capitalists on a world, world scale fighting over, world scale fighting over who was going to have the lion's share of the colonies, um, of the markets, of the raw materials, of all the avenues of profit to, to be made. So exactly who started the war, who had the first shot, you know, every protagonist of that war claimed they were fighting a war of defense. In the Second World War, you can say that the Soviet Union truly was fighting a war of defense. But the capitalist powers in the First World War who went to war, the capitalist powers in the Second World War who went to war were fighting aggressive wars for profit and plunder. Um, and those deaths are directly attributable to capitalism. But we're encouraged to mark them, to wear our poppy, our pride and respect. And of course, we lament the hundred million workers who were sacrificed on the high altar of capital. Of course we do. But that poppy, we're encouraged to celebrate our capitalist class who were the very criminals <laughs> who sent those hundred million workers to their deaths and we're never asked to give to give them any historical accountability for their crimes um, or the ongoing crimes of the wars they fight or the ongoing crimes of the impoverishment of the mass of humanity because if half of humanity have less than those six individuals it's not without victims they're constant victims and people who are dying of malnutrition and malnutrition related diseases every year probably 16 million children and probably over 40 million people in total worldwide die every year, essentially from poverty, you know, and the problems associated with poverty. That's before we talk about wars. That's before we talk about, you know, the Saudi war in Yemen. That's before we talk about our war in Iraq, before we talk about our disruption of Libya and the slave trading that it's brought back in and it's on its heels under the tender care of the United Nations, the United States and the UK government. So, you know, all of that mass mayhem, destruction, murder, impoverishment, dislocation of society, disorganization of production, you know, that's there's real costs to that. And they're real, what's real violence and real murder that's inherent in the capitalist system. Now, of course, the capitalist propagandists, as we as we talked about, want to say there's nothing higher than capitalism. So they always look at any attempt to break free of that system and punish it. Everyone who makes a revolution, they do their best to strangle it. If Cuba tries to make a revolution and break free, they'll put a blockade around it, stop it from having medicines, stop it from getting normal trade. Every country needs to trade to get goods. No country is entirely self-sufficient. So the fact that the capitalists are able to encircle um, any socialist nation, try and strangle it economically, try and ferment discord within it, as we're seeing in Belarus you know, at the moment, to, uh, these color revolutions that they create. It doesn't have to be a socialist country, you just have to be an independent nation and they'll try and ferment discord and overthrow your nation if you threaten their ability to make unbridled profit from their system. We've seen it in Yugoslavia, they certainly did it around the Soviet Union. They will, you know, our historians under this system tell us that all of those things are inherent faults of anyone who breaks free of the system. But it's like blaming, you know, a slave for trying to run away from the plantation. It's like blaming him for the fact that then dogs were set on him, that the other workers were also punished for his escape and saying, well, this is your fault. You know, you're, this is a very violent thing you've done of you know, taking your hand and striking your master. It's not violent to try and end this inherent system of perpetual violence. But yes, the capitalists have huge armies, huge state mechanisms, huge prisons, huge police forces. They have a whole mechanism of force intended to keep that exploitation, which is a system of violence going. And in order to break it, you know, how, how do you break free? Other countries try and break free. They send armies there to destroy them. And they have destroyed country after country. So there's a price for standing up. There's always a price for, you know, your maintaining your independence and dignity but that is not um something that's inherent in socialism that's something that's inherent in the ruling class because they're cynical why are they you know why do you see these jeffrey epsteins you know come again and again why are they such um anti-social ways why are they so cynical because to them life is cheap their entire mode of existence is built upon exploitation is built upon slavery is built upon impoverishing masses so that you know everything has a price for them uh, everything has a low value you know, human life itself is cheap. Um, so they're incredibly antisocial. And we are, of course, tried to indoctrinate to say there's no other way of living. It's the least worst system. We're constantly bombarded with that propaganda. And that's reflected 
in, in all kinds of ways, from the pulpit, from you know mainstream media, from the words of our politicians, particularly at the time when they were trying to destroy um, Jeremy Corbyn or, or you know or the Labour Party, any notion that there's a, a way of building society which is more equal, or workers could have a better share. There's no magic money tree, but there's always a magic money tree when the bourgeoisie need bailing out. So, you know, I think we just have to learn to, you can study each individual example when they say every socialist movement has been bloody and violent. Every time you study it, it turns out to be a lie. Um, but, you know, you, you'd have to, I, I can't kind of go through chapter and verse of every single one, but I think we have to just bear that in mind. Our exploits say our exploiters have a violent system that they use to ensnare the world's population, impoverish us. Anyone trying to break free of it, they will try and punish us, but we just have to be aware that, you know, the fault for all of that violence lies with them. The fault for the violence of world wars lies with them. The fault for the you know, death through poverty and exploitation lies with them. And to end that system is not an act of violence. It's an act of great peace <laughs> and love for humanity. But, you know, they won't, in all likelihood, they'll do everything they can to try and stop us. But as, as I said before, you know, the better job we do, the more we inspire others to, to join that struggle, the, the better job we do of building the socialist movement, the more peaceful that transition will be because they won't be able to resist. And as I said before, workers are workers in uniform. The army, sorry, the army and the police essentially are workers in uniform. They, they ultimately, a large section of them, will stand with us. So we, we are not in any way for violence, we're for peace, we're for ending the violence of this exploitative system. Um, in terms of very, just the one last quick answer, honestly quick, <laughs> about the public sector and private sector. So under capitalism, um, so first of all, all of these things like teachers, um, doctors, the things that we are able to get on the state, which are greatly to the benefit of the working people, we have fought for. They have not been given free. We workers have demanded it as they've demanded an increase in their wages. They've demanded an increase in their social wage, which is this, which is a reflection of the same thing. So all the things that, that you know, librarians, things that are under attack, actually, that are things under threat of privatization currently, precisely because our socialist movement is relatively weak. The capitalists would like to do away with it. The capitalists were very happy to have a relatively low standard of life, particularly for unproductive workers, workers that they don't make profit from. They've got no interest at all in giving us a cultured and, and decent uh, life. It's just a waste of profit for them. So they will try and destroy it. But we have won those services. Um, in terms of Britain as a whole, Britain is overwhelmingly kind of a service economy. And we'll talk about that when we talk more about capitalism, the way it develops to monopoly and imperialism. Um, but a lot of the money that our capitalists make, they make from exploiting labor overseas. And as a result of those vast profits they make over hundreds of years time, the amount of money they have in the system means that despite the fact that, you know, we workers are relatively impoverished compared to the capitalist class in our country, of course, you know, we are not as um, oppressed. Our historical level of uh, uh, conditions of life have a certain minimum and they're fighting, they're battling to, you know, over time, they can get it down. Our lives are unquestionably getting worse. Everyone can feel that over the last 10 to 15 years. Um, but we're not as uh, deeply impoverished as many workers are in other countries throughout, throughout the third world that, that has to be recognized. So, um, uh, you know, we do have teachers, we do have doctors, they are relatively well paid and they don't create surplus value, but they're a necessary part of maintaining the overall social wage of the whole of the working class and therefore, you know, producing profit through productive enterprises. Um, uh, and, and that's essentially how, how you have to look at, you have to look at the working class as a whole, the capitalist class as a whole, the overall mechanism by which value is created is through, you know, production of yeah, goods and, and also services which create value. Um, the capitalist makes money through essentially unpaid labor time of his workers. Um, but always uh, under capitalism, there are things that they can't make money from that needs very heavy investment. Um, that those things are loss making enterprises that are necessary for the whole of capitalism whether it's health service, whether it's railways at a certain point that need huge investment, you know, those things which are, are a debt 
which are loss-making enterprises are the ones which are nationalized. So the, the national um, economy, which is raised by taxation overwhelmingly of the working people, generally goes to paying the loss-making enterprises that are needed by a nation, whereas the really heavily profit-making enterprises are inevitably and always and in every case uh, in, in private hands. So the debt is nationalized and the profit uh, is, is privatized under capitalism. I think that was probably an answer to all those questions. That's brilliant. Thank you very much, Ranjit. We're now going to go to Kat. Hi, uh, Ranjit. Um, it's actually quite good that you've just spoken about that because it kind of links into my question quite nicely. Um, but I just wanted to ask um, you to expand a little bit. I know you talked a bit about this last week, um, but expand a little bit about um, the role of unpaid labour in the capitalist economy. Because um, what I think I've seen happening over the last few years is areas of um, areas of the economy, like you were talking about, that produce the social wage, the parts of it that can be exploited and turned into you know commodified and turned into profit making have been privatized over the last few years and also at the same time the parts of that work which is actually really necessary to provide for the needs of the people have just been put under this banner of big society and everybody who used to be paid to do these things now ordinary people are expected to just do them alongside their waged work, you know, um, disabled care, old age care. Um, only the most commodifiable parts have been privatised and the rest of that burden has just been pushed back onto the workers. So it's creating this double burden of very low paid work, high unemployment and a huge burden of providing these services for our own selves that we maybe necessarily didn't necessarily have before. Great observation and question, Kat. I'm just going to take a few more people and then we'll uh, come back to Ranji. Uh, I'm going to go to Christina now. Yes, um, I think what I wanted to say really again ties in with what Kat was saying. Um, especially right now, during the crisis, we've seen all the unpaid work that um, carers had to do at home. Um, especially um, mothers, um, and um, women who have been traditionally put in very uh, precarious positions. Um, so this is a, a very important point. For many years, we have um, had people saying that capitalism works with, because the wealth produced has a, what they call the trickling down effect, that the wealth produced will um, eventually reach the workers. Um, and there has, no, there has not been a bigger lie than that. And we can see it clearly now. Uh, what happens in periods of uh, crisis like that, like it happened in the depression, um, bourgeois economists will try to convince us again to save capitalism, to share the burden, to share the debt. So therefore to help the economy move on. So women um, and uh, carers um, should not complain, should do their bit. Um, like in the war situation, the country needs you. It's basically the capitalists need you to continue what you do um, unpaid. So we see that now. And again, they are selling us this lie that uh, uh, there is a way out of this uh, with um, improvisations of government expenditures, which is, of course, this Keynesian economics, um, and um, this promise that there is a way out of this. It didn't work uh, back in the 30s, uh, and it won't work now, because capitalism will keep producing this crisis, and these are just little patches uh, on a big wound. Um, uh, we see now you know, um, those kind of initiatives where they give you discounts to go and eat out uh, to help restaurants move. But how can you do that when your own position is, uh, you know, uh, unviable uh, financially? How can you afford to eat out? I mean, you cannot afford even to, to go to the supermarket and fill your fridge to feed your kids. Um, so the what I think is very important in all these weeks um, 
discussion is that it becomes clear, even to people who haven't studied economics, that there are two, two different schools of, the, of thought. One serves the bourgeoisie and doesn't see uh, the, the forest, but sees the tree, and the tree is how to keep producing profit. So they um, explain economy as a mechanism for them to continue to make profit. And there is a way of explaining the economy for us, for us workers. And this is what we do. And the surplus value is the big elephant of, in the room that bourgeois economists never talk about, but that Marx explained. So if we look at this concept and how profit is produced and where it goes, uh, then we kind of unveil, you know, we certainly lift the veil out of your eyes and you see the reality. And you see that this is not natural. There is no naturalness about this process, about this exploitation. Uh, but what they do is they push this language and they push this um, surplus value. Now they call it in universities, for example, or in schools, you have to prove that your teaching, which is of course commoditized, has value added so that it can be profitable for the university or for the school to continue it. So you see how this, this language um, and its pretense at being natural, you know, gets into even domains that are not to be privatized, like uh, the NHS or the school system. Um, and one last point um, uh, to, to just to add to what Bob was saying about cars, um, we saw, if you remember the beginning of lockdown, a lot of food that was given for free by the supermarkets because this chaos of the market, this chaos of not having a plan overproduces and when it cannot sell it for profit, it destroys it. And this is madness. This is a crime in itself. The same thing with the housing uh, bubble. We have so many houses around the area where I live, the center of London that could be serving nurses could be serving key workers and they're empty because no one right now buys them because of the crisis so you know it is there's nothing natural about capitalism on the contrary is the most crazy way of seeing life thank you brilliant thank you christina i'm gonna go to robert now hi hello Hi, you, yeah? yeah, we can hear you. Loud. My question is, Anjit, is um, with the deregulation of industry and amenities through neoliberal globalization, how, as a party, are we to combat the capitalists if they're no longer in our uh, region, our nationality? I mean, if you look through a list of the amenities what Britain had, uh, like N Power is in Germany, Angry Water is in Canada, Thames Water is in Germany, Orange is French, Arriva Buses is in Germany, Gatwick Airport is run by South Korea. Cabarets is in the US here. The M6 tool is run by Australia. Just to mention a few. All the real franchises have been sold off in the likes of uh, East Midlands. That's under the Dutch uh, state. So with all, the, with all of our amenities and industries owned by uh, neoliberals, uh, globalized neoliberals, how is how are we as a party able to combat these organizations and get back the power? That's my question. That's a great question, Rob. Are you happy to come back on those, Ranji? Yeah, I am. Can you hear me? Um, beautiful contributions. Um, Christina, Kat, Rob, thank you so much. Um, Christina, not much to add to anything you've got to say other than say I couldn't agree more. Um, 
Kat, I think you had a, a particular question about kind of increasingly um, downgrading really of those necessary state services, the unpaid labor, the carers, uh, the, you see it in the NHS, increasing amounts of volunteer labor being drafted in. I mean, COVID was used as an excuse to say everyone should volunteer about three quarters of a million volunteered to work in the NHS. All those names have been taken and those people will be rolled out as a volunteer labor force doing all kinds of things. They haven't, they weren't really used during the, the pandemic, but their names will be taken and they could be doing all kinds of services, which essentially were previously taken by paid workers. So in times of increasing unemployment, um, you find this um, increasing, well, they had it after World War I in Germany at the time of hyperinflation and the collapse of their economy, you know, almost a kind of national service elements, increasing armies of basically relatively poorly paid laborers who are deployed, sometimes a very backward technology. We've said that capitalism has a motive for increasing technology. At sometimes, you know, they'll, they'll put gangs of millions of people to work during the Great Depression with shovels, shoveling holes and filling them up again for a pittance to keep them out of trouble, just about keep them from starvation though. Some do starve. So there's an incredible waste of human labor power. I mean, we saw with the last crisis, I'm a bit worried that my computer is going to run out of battery and then I'll lose you, but I'll try and carry on. And in a second, I'll, I'll keep this short and I'll go and quickly put, plug my, my computer in. Um, but essentially, we saw this after the last crisis. Huge amounts of debt was generated by banks that failed. We were told they were too big to fail. They were bailed out by national economies. Hundreds of billions. <laughs> hundreds of billions of our money was given to bail out the banks who then were basically forgiven their debt, no obligation ever to pay it back again or pay it back again once it's kind of meaningless to pay back, they'll pay back their shares of profit and then they'll never lose out. So a huge amount of money was given from us, from workers tax that were meant to go on our services to them. There was a massive transfer of debt from private companies who apparently are meant to take risk, that's why they justify their, 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 their profits, to nations, to state economies. We were all then put into massive debt and on the basis of that austerity was driven. This was Cameron's big society idea that we were gonna stop funding, you know, what had been services that we'd fought for and that the working class need as survival mechanisms, particularly when our families are basically broken up and at atomized because we're all forced to run all over the country as paid wage laborers wherever we can find a job. We're not apparently forced to go, but if we don't work, we starve. So we run and break up our families in the, in the most uneconomic and unsocial ways, you know, break up working class communities. So we're forced to have all kinds of in this country uh, and other capitalist countries, services that would previously have been done by the family, you know, all kinds of care, all kinds of care homes, all kinds of NHS, those things we need and they're being taken away actually because of the debt that's been transferred. So, so it's an austerity measure, which is then being said, you know, it's a wonderful thing to volunteer. It's so good for you. Uh, it's so good for your feeling of well-being within the... Well, it seems we've lost Ranjit there, sadly. Um, I hope he remembers in future, just like you should put a ventilator onto a person you're having an operation on. You put your, put your charger into your laptop before a meeting. Nevertheless, that takes us almost through to half past nine. So I might as well say goodbye now. I want to thank Ranji, even in his absence, for a fantastic presentation. I want to thank you all for your questions and your contributions. So I hope you have all a brilliant night. Hopefully see all of you who are in here in the meeting tomorrow night in the members meeting. And uh, everyone else who's watching, catch you next Tuesday. Good night, everyone.